Hi, TEDx Hollywood. Um, thank you so much, Ken and Dan and the whole TED community. Um, Chris Anderson, it's amazing to be back here um, on the TED stage. Um, I'm honored to be back here. I've, uh, I've spent uh, the last 15 years of my life um, filming people, filming stories um, that, uh, that have inspired change, that I hope will inspire change. Um, the people that I've followed uh, have opened their lives um, and have let me in uh, to, to some amazing moments, um, which I hope will inspire other people. Um, I wish that they could be here today, the people that I filmed, because they could tell their stories a lot better than I can, um, but they can't be here. So today I'm going to show you a little bit of clips from a few of the films that I've done to be able to bring them to you. Um, they range from you know, a, a dot-com executive in New York that I followed to um, a couple of Jazeera reporters, um, a military press officer, um, to Rafia, a Jordanian Bedouin woman who uh, lives in the desert in a tent, um, to most recently, the last two years, I've been filming on the ground in the Egyptian uh, revolution. Um, and I've, have filmed some people that have been the most inspiring people um, that I've ever met. But uh, my hope is that when I finish a film, by sharing the stories of people who have changed their own lives, people can see that change and be inspired. Um, every person that I've spent this time following has deeply affected my life and challenged many of my beliefs in some way. Um, so, uh, so just to, to be able to, uh, to take you quickly to um, the, uh, the characters. البنت صف خامس أو سادس خلاص روحوها من المدرسة عيب غير وضع البلد أنت مخدين عندي فكرة إني ولا شيء أضحك سواء في كل حاجة صح ولا لا لا بالعكس أنا راح أوريك مال إنتاج Can we start by someone getting up who is 40 years old and a grandmother. They've never been to school? Is your mother at school? No. Everything in this book, the grandmother will learn in six months. So if the lady is scared, now is the time to say no. Mudir al Barnamij fil Hind. Can we ask all the men here, if she agrees, will they agree to let her go? Knows nothing about solar, nothing about electronics, nothing about mathematics. What is she scared of? Is she scared that she might fail? There are going to be 30 women like her who does not know how to read and write. Thank you. 
so as you can see, I, I stand on the shoulders of amazing people, um, and I hope that they um, are able to open their lives and, uh, and trust me, and when they do, it's a magical experience. But in the digital age, um, we're bombarded with information, and it's often overwhelming. That's why we need good stories, because good stories turn that information into emotion. And while emo information sort of passes through us, emotions stick with us and become a part of us. The reason why this whole uh, film came about was um, because I met a guy named Bunker Roy. Um, in the freezing snow of Utah, I was part of this sort of speed dating thing that Sundance Institute and Skoll um, Foundation put together, where they put together um, uh, social entrepreneurs and filmmakers, hoping that they'll come together and make a great story. Um, so Bunker told me about this college that existed halfway across the world called the Barefoot College, where his star students are grandmothers. And these grandmothers leave their villages for the very first time. Um, they don't have running water or electricity, and they learn how to become, in six months, solar engineers. Um, I thought this was a very exciting idea, but I thought, how is it possible that he's going to go to the Middle East where I grew up, he's going to go to tents and villages and convince these people to let their women go? It seemed like an implausible idea, but I wanted to be there, um, and he agreed to let me go. Um, I had to see this for myself. And um, basically went there, um, filmed two women from Jordan that had agreed to go and then backed out at the last minute because they both realized that they just, they couldn't, they didn't have the courage, they didn't have the ability to go against their, the story that had been written for them. Um, you know, we're defined by our narratives, and, uh, and these women had not been able to, to, to break out of the narrative of their village that they have to stay home, they can't leave, they can't get a job. But Rafia, when she had, was faced with this opportunity, she jumped at this opportunity, um, and she, literally got on a plane when she heard the possibility of going and, and left um, the very next day. Um, Rafia broke the barrier, and she was ready to create a new story for herself. My friend and writer Duncan North says, we're inclined to think of stories in a positive way most of the time, but most stories are cement that can bind us to old ways of thinking and being. And it's a rare and powerful story that smashes that concrete and opens a path for something old, from something old to something new. It takes courage and it takes vision for anyone to rewrite their own story. And it's those stories, those people, who rewrite their lives that inspire others and create change. Rafia was a woman that saw this opportunity to change her story, and she leapt at it. Now, while Rafia was learning solar engineering in India, I went back home to hang out with my parents in Cairo. And um, I was waiting for the next time that I would go back um, with my co-director, Monel Daif, to, to film Rafia. Um, and there were rumblings happening there at the time um, that, there were, that there was this huge protest that was going to be planned for January 25th. Um, I called a friend of mine, an incredible woman named Buthaina Kamel, who I had actually filmed in 2007, um, when she had left her uh, government job reporting the state news on television, and she had left in order to, because she had realized there was so much corruption happening at the voting booths, that she wanted to use her ability with the camera and talking to people to start recording these stories and take this to the judges, um, to start changing the regime from the inside out. That film came out in 2007 and was called Egypt, We're Watching You. Um, but when this was happening in Egypt, I thought, there's, uh, there, there, there's, there, I, I called Bosaina because she was somebody who had access to what was going on um, in the street. And what she did was she said, well, just take a look at this. This is a video of a young woman, and there were many other like her, that were uploading what they felt needed to happen on January 25th. And I'll show you a little piece of that video that, um, that was the spark for change. I have a video so I'll show you a video so I'll show you a video. I want to show you a video so I'll show you a video. If we still have a crime, and we still want to live as a human being, and as a human being in this country, we have to show you a video so I'll show you a video. 
هننزل نطالب بحقنا بحقنا كبني ادم وكل واحد في البلد دي بيقول البنات اللي بتنزل مظاهره بتتبهدل وما يصحش ان هي تنزل وحرام يخلي عنده نخوه ورجوله وينزل يوم 25 الحته هتقع عليك وهتقع علينا كلنا انزل وطالب بحقك وبحقي وبحق اهلك وبحقنا كلنا انا نازله يوم 25 وهقول للفساد لا والنظام لا about 22 I know she looks about 12 but um, her story spread like wildfire um, and uh, you know what she was saying was absolutely unheard of I grew up in a country where if you brought up politics tried to start talking to a cab driver about politics they would change the subject you just could not talk about the president or what was wrong and happening in the country but people had seen a glimpse of what had happened in Tunisia and they had been they had seen what was possible and that, that, that sense of possibility um, that was out there was, was contagious. Um, similar to Rosa Parks, when she sat on the front of a bus, Asma and many others like her stood in the square and decided that they were not going to move until the regime changed. Once an idea like this comes along and is put out there with confidence and simplicity and emotion, it's incredible with what speed things can change. She and other young people, broke this traditional narrative that you could not change your life and you could not change your country. They broke barriers, they claimed their own rights, and they decided to write their own future. And this is a process that is still happening today. When I joined the demonstrators in the square, um, I was overjoyed and absolutely blown away by the beauty in the square. People of all different um, backgrounds and socioeconomic conditions together fighting for change. Um, it was like something I had never seen before, planning a different country. But there was a huge part of me that was um, very worried, very nervous. I had filmed demonstrations in the past and knew that people could be jailed and disappeared. Um, and so when I, when I got to the square, I, I realized that my, my fear about this, that, that, that all of these people could get crushed, was coming from a place where I had lost the hope that people can change their own country. I had sort of, I realized that I had lost the hope in the power of people changing things. Um, I'd lived in New York for eight years. I had marched against the Iraq war. Nothing had happened. How could the country that I grew up in, Egypt, where people could be jailed for years for doing very little and for speaking out against the government, how could this actually work? Is this a naive thing? Are all of these people going to get um, completely crushed? But I stood there, and it wasn't saying a lot that I stood there. I have an American passport. If I get jailed, I had connections that could get me out of prison. But I was standing next to people that if they got arrested, they could be disappeared for life. Or, you know, you, you, you didn't know what your fate was. But again, this, this courage is overwhelming and contagious. People decided that they no longer wanted to live in a country where they could not affect their future, where they could not change their future. Where Rafia's story was uh, you know, some story of personal transformation, what I want to show you today is the people that we were following in Tahrir was, sh was showing the transformation of the story of an entire nation. Um, the, the, the belief that, they could, that, that you could go from a belief in that amount of time that you could have no effect in your country to, do, to, to changing your country was huge. Um, I'd like to just drop you in on, on the Egyptian revolution for a couple minutes. So. Here we go. A revolution is what we witnessed. The police keep trying to disperse the protests, and you can see the protesters just keep pushing them back. saying that Hosni Mubarak is stepping down. We are seeing history unfold in the Middle East. Egypt will never be the same. Is it true? Has that happened? I don't know. It looks like it. You want me to start from why did we go down, right? The second one, I had a phone call 
from the army, I think, telling me take the cameras off Tahrir Square because the scene will be ugly. The army entered the offices of most media outlets surrounding the square and confiscated equipment, trying to prevent these kinds of, of pictures uh, from emerging. لأن هي طبعا حكايتنا محدش بيحكيها غير غيرنا احنا I'm gonna get it out online. Yeah, I think we can cut into the breaking news out of Egypt. Most of them not videotaped, their death not reported. <laughs> Thank you. These are some, uh, thank you. These are some scenes um, from the square. We recently opened it at Sundance, um, but we're still working on it because as you may have seen in the news, the revolution is ongoing. Um, but this is uh, one of the most collaborative films I have ever worked on. Um, I got to the square and I met the rest of my crew in the square. You in Hollywood probably know that you, you normally find your crew before you actually make the film. But um, our cameras were confiscated. We had to use new cameras. Our DP we met in the square saw the camera we were using and said, you're using it all wrong. I'll be your DP. I'll help you. And then we met the other shooters in the square. Khaled Abdullah I met in the square, who's one of our characters. Um, he was the lead in The Kite Runner comes from a long generation of political activists. Um, and I met his wife, she was his girlfriend at the time, and she came on board and decided to start filming him. So she became part of our team. Um, and uh, he's still there uh, in, the, in, the, in the square fighting in, in Egypt um, right now. But it was an incredibly, incredibly um, collaborative uh, experience. Um, and we followed an, an amazing group of characters, all who we met uh, in the square. Our entire team of filmmakers has been shot at, jailed, hospitalized, um, and you can't hire people to go through that. People who are going through that have to 
be wanting um, to be there. But I think it's a rare gift to be able to work with and film people who are willing to put everything on the line to change their country and to fight for what they believe in and to leave a better future for their children. Um, and so they gave us that opportunity, uh, the characters we followed. Um, one, uh, one of our characters, uh, Ahmed, um, is a, uh, he's a young journalist now, um, but he, um, he was with us on Huffington Post recently, um, and he was asked in an interview um, what he hoped the film would do, um, what effect it would, would have, and Ahmed said, Look, we have, we have lived with lies our entire lives. We've been lied to since the day that we were born by everybody around us. And we hope that by making a film like this about the truth, by participating in a film like this, we'll be able to leave this to our children and our grandchildren so that they can see the truth of how change happens, how difficult it is, how you have to keep fighting for it. And maybe if they can see the truth, they can build a better future for themselves. Ahmed's become another hero of mine who has learned now how to use the camera, and who is shaping and defying government television every single day. He's putting up his own pieces of news um, online, and those pieces of news are often picked up by large networks, and so they do get out there, and they do change the narrative. Um, and actually, just a little while ago, I was back in the Cairo office, and I showed Ahmed a clip of Rafia because we were, um, we, we, you know, we were, we were editing the film in our office in Cairo. And he said, "You have to show me the whole thing. I have to see this. She's the most inspiring woman." I said, "Inspiring to you? I've just watched you dodge bullets and change your country." And he said, "No, no, no. She, I have to show this to my mother and my sister." And I said, you know, I, you know I, I don't think that solar panels are really going to work in your section of Cairo, your very overcrowded area of Cairo. He said, it's not about the solar panels. It's about Rafia. She, he, she, he knew that his mother and sisters, even though she's from another country, Jordan, could empathize um, with her. And he felt like if they saw Rafia and the courage that Rafia had had to change her life, they would feel like they could change their lives. My, right, my, my very good friend and writer, Nicholas Klein, says um, that empathy is the genius of the heart. And that uh, when you're able to empathize with characters who take you on a journey of possibility, that is when you can possibly inspire change. And what I've seen in these grandmothers in Kenya and in Jordan and Rafia in the youth of Egypt is this miracle of human nature, that lightning change is possible when people see that, that potential um, for change. Now, Egypt may not be a success story, you've all seen the news, but this story is far from over. The hope in people has been awakened, and the fear has been broken, and the new narrative is still being written. It was many years um, with the civil rights movement before many of the legal changes are made, were made, they're still being made, and we cannot give up on these everyday heroes. They're determined to keep going. They will not give up. They're passionate, they're alive, and they'll ultimately change their country because of that unwill unwillingness to give up. Howard Thurman says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The people you've seen up here on the screen, they are the most alive people that I have ever met. And their passion is contagious. Their flame cannot be extinguished. They are the embodiment of stories for change. So help us share their stories. Thank you very much. <laughs>